Well, our scripture reading uh, this morning is actually from the book of Malachi, uh, chapter 3, verse 6, through chapter 4, verse 6. The book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 6, through chapter 4, verse 6. Um, this might feel sort of random. We were just in the book of Daniel. We finished that series last Sunday, but it's not. This is actually tethered to our series in Daniel, as we will discuss. Uh, and if you're new to the church, you've never been here before, I think you'll be able to hang just fine. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through chapter 4, verse 6. Passage is up on the screen. If you have a Bible, pull that out and follow along with us as well. And if you are able to stand, please stand for the reading and for the honoring of God's word. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. In the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? That you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge, or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test, and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming, that is coming, shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch, but as for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a degree of utter destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, a passage like this is complex. There's tension in here. There's reasons to be encouraged. There's reasons to be warned. And Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you administer not only to us corporately, but to us individually and, and bring to our hearts exactly what we need to see and hear in this text. And not only hear it, but understand it and apply it wisely to our lives. It's not easy to talk about obedience. Um, Father, we need your help and we ask for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah, so not only are we preaching from an obscure minor prophet this morning, but we are talking about obedience. Amen? Um, if some of you are parents, you're probably thinking, yeah, preach on. We preach about obedience all you want. Um, amen? But I am specifically talking about our collective obedience to God's word, including the standards that God gives his people in the law, Sermon on the Mount, which we preached through last year and in many other places throughout Scripture. 
And we're talking about obedience because pastorally I'm concerned about obedience. And I'm concerned about it because in our day, I keep seeing it either A, downplayed, almost to the point of non-existence. I mean, consider that the Puritans used to name rather commonly their, their daughters obedience. Can you imagine that today, right? A daughter named legalism, maybe, or a son named Pharisee. I see it downplayed almost to the point of non-existence. Or B, I see obedience basically equated with Christianity itself. In other words, Christians are people who do Christian things. And both of these extremes show up very often when we're living in the dark, especially here in our individualistic West. If life is hard, what is the point in paying much attention to the rules? Just do what you can to find some nibbles of happiness here and there. You know, plus, plus if, if somebody is suffering, they should really just be focusing on themselves. You know, they, they can't be bothered with obligations to an external authority like God and certainly not obligations to a community or to a group. Or conversely, if life is hard, maybe it's hard because... You're not cutting it, you know? I mean, you're not following the rules. God might even be against you, thus you're suffering. So if you want things to change, get your act together. Get on the straight and narrow. It's kind of a prosperity theology. Thus, the postlude we're doing this morning in the book of Malachi, a postlude to our series in the book of Daniel, which we finished last Sunday. Malachi ministered to Israelites in Judah somewhere around 450 B.C., so basically 80 years after we last checked in with Daniel in 536 B.C. By Malachi's day, the Jerusalem temple had finally been rebuilt, but it just did not match the glory of the former temple, and life remained really hard and, frankly, really frustrating, even though the exiles had re-inhabited Judah nearly 80 years Prior, that process was already in motion when Daniel received his final vision. They thought things were going to go this way, and things absolutely went that way. And guess what? They were struggling with obedience. Really struggling with it. They were struggling to follow God's law during the extended season of very significant darkness. So let's drop in on these Israelites and hopefully learn from them. This is, kind of, this is like a sequel, right? This is like watching that Indiana Jones movie that just came out a few weeks ago where we're checking on some friends when they're much older to see how they're doing. Two reflections this morning, two reflections as we drop in on Israel and see how they're doing 80 or so years after we left Daniel. Number one, obedience still matters in the dark. And then number two, God never changes. Obedience still matters in the dark. And then number two, God never changes. Let's start with that first one. Church, obedience still matters even when you're in the dark. The Israelites in Malachi's day had so many reasons to be really bummed out. The rebuilt temple was just kind of meh. The glory of God didn't seem to have re-inhabited it like they expected. There was geopolitical turmoil always going on all around them, including constant harassment from various adversaries. You never knew when you were going to get attacked or threatened or whatever the case may be. They weren't autonomous. Remember, before the exile, they were ruled by a series of Davidic kings, and now they're under the authority of the Persians, who were so-so. They kind of gave them some autonomy, but not totally. Taxes were really high. It was burdensome. And here's the other thing. Uh, the population of Judah actually was not huge. Maybe, like maybe half the size of Alachua County, a county that some say is the greatest in the United States. <laughs> the difficulty of all of these circumstances was compounded by the ministry of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, who had basically told the Israelites, hey, here's the thing. If you keep going with this temple rebuilding project, which was going really poorly, it was really fraught, but if you, if you keep going, God will bless you. 
You'll experience economic prosperity. Your land will increase. The glory of God will inhabit the temple again, etc., etc. The problem is they kept going. They apparently finished this temple by the time of Malachi's ministry, and um, the blessings weren't exactly flowing in their estimation. And eventually, all of this disappointment morphed into spiritual cynicism and malaise. Their faith was still there, kind of, technically, but it was very lethargic. And the lethargy showed up, showed up in their religious practices as well as their dealings in the marketplace, their interactions with people on the margins, you name it. For example, chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, the Israelites weren't contributing a full tithe as is spelled out for them in the law. And since the tithes directly benefited the priests and the Levites who oversaw the temple and the sacrifices, insufficient tithing undermined the Israelites' corporate worship. Speaking of the priests, they were offering defiled sacrifices to the Lord. They were bringing him animals that were blind and lame and sick. You can see that in Malachi chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Or how about chapter 3, verse 5, the verse right before the text we read, bosses were underpaying their employees, often by withholding wages. Widows, the fatherless, sojourners were being neglected, if not oppressed. One of the themes you see over and over again in Scripture is that relationships without God eventually become oppressive. And the malaise and the spiritual boredom were so severe that the Israelites were actually saying to one another, can you believe this? This is chapter 3, verse 14. It is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? Profit? I mean, this is a really inspiring decision-making tree, right? What's in it for me? You know, what's in it for us? If we can't discern an obvious answer to that, then we won't do it. So God said to his people, what did he say? He told them, maybe he told them, hey, you know, don't, don't worry too much about any of these issues you're dealing with here. I know your circumstances are very difficult right now. It's very hard under Persian authority. Your neighbors are not friendly. You know, when things improve, we can work on making some corrections. But for now, just hang in there. Just take care of yourselves. Don't worry about it. No, that's not what he told them. This is what he actually told them. Verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Or how about verse 8? You know this whole shorting me in the tithe thing? You're robbing me. Verse 10. Please start bringing the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. I have a high opinion of all of you, truly, couldn't be higher. But can we admit that had we found ourselves on the receiving end of these exhortations from the Lord, we might have become, I mean, at least a touch defensive. I get defensive just when we call the AC guy to the house, because you know how it always goes. The AC guy shows up, he pulls out the filter immediately, and he's always like, hey, this filter is dirtier than it should be. When was the last time you changed the filter? And I'm always like, you don't know my life. <laughs> I get emotional. I start choking up, and I tell him about my life. Like, no. I think we would all be tempted to respond to God in these kinds of circumstances by saying something like, you don't know my life. Things are really hard down here. And you're worried about a full tithe? Malachi, messenger of God, why don't you send a message from us back to God telling him to just give us a hug instead or maybe tell our neighbors to stop harassing us or maybe to tell the Persians to lower the taxes. How about that? Here's the thing, though. God does know our lives. He created us. He knows everything about us. He's omniscient. He knows everything about everything going on around us. And here's something that makes Christianity really unique among major religions. Jesus, the Son of God, 
became fully human, what we refer to as the incarnation, and lived on this earth, personally experiencing all sorts of difficulties, culminating, of course, in being obedient to the point of death on the cross. So yeah, God knows our lives. And yet, even in seasons of difficulty, when we're in the dark, he still calls his people to walk with him and to obey him. Look how explicit God is in chapter 4, verse 4. This summary exhortation, basically for the entire book of Malachi. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. That's the summary for the hurting people. Remember the law. Keep walking in obedience. Or how about Jesus' great commission to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28? Do you remember it? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, that is, to obey, all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And there's no asterisk there next to observe. You know, like, observe unless things are just really hard. And mind you, those disciples were about to experience um, very great difficulties. All sorts of persecution on account of their ministry and their affiliation with Jesus. In fact, their obedience would itself catalyze plenty of difficulties for them. Why obedience in all seasons? Why not just obedience in some seasons? Why obedience in all of the seasons, even when we're in the dark? Even when, frankly, it might not feel all that genuine. A lot of reasons, but I'm going to focus on three this morning. Number one, church, please understand that God's statutes are given to us with our flourishing in mind. We talked about this during our series in the Sermon on the Mount. We talked about this a lot. God's statutes, his rules, they are not arduous, they are not arbitrary. They're actually supremely wise, and they are always loving in all seasons. Psalm 1, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. Winter flourish even in dark seasons, Plant yourself by the stream. And God loves blessing our faithfulness. This is Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Try doing things my way and see what happens. In dark seasons, there are really good reasons to believe that faithful obedience will help you navigate the valley and eventually emerge from it. Not because we earn that emergence. This is not prosperity theology. Christian obedience is not transactional. But it is the case that life generally works better when we follow the Creator's directions. And He really does like to bless our obedience. Eugene Peterson puts this really beautifully in a book that I would commend to all of you called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Here's how he puts it. Our lives are lived well only when they are lived on the terms of their creation, with God loving and us being loved, with God making and us being made, with God revealing and us understanding, with God commanding and us responding. Number two, second reason why obedience makes sense even when we're in the dark. Obedience is a means of directly or indirectly worshiping God, which nourishes us spiritually when we're in dark seasons. Robbing God of the full tithe prevented the priests and the Levites who oversaw the temple and the sacrifices from doing their jobs, which exacerbated the spiritual decay that was going on in Judah. Right worship 
does the opposite. It nourishes us, and it helps us persevere even when we're in the blender, especially when we're in the blender. Today, we're not making animal sacrifices. We don't worship at the temple, but Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we do present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. And in doing so, we're transformed by the renewal of our mind. Worship also declares the holy set-apartness of God to those around us who might also be in the valley but not know God. Many, and this is encouraging, many, many people, many people have become Christians upon observing faithful obedience and worship by Jesus' followers during the crucibles of their lives, which turns heads and it glorifies God like pretty much nothing else. Holy, set-apart living points to our holy, set-apart God and is such a compelling testimony. Number three, obedience. This is maybe the most surprising one and one I really do want to emphasize this morning. Obedience helps us cultivate true friendship with God. Have you ever thought about obedience in that light? I got to tell you, in dark seasons, mere intellectual assent to God is not going to cut it. You need true relationship. Valleys call for something deeper, and obedience actually helps cultivate friendship with the God of the universe. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statues statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Obedience, in this case for the Israelites, it was bringing in the full tithe, helps us return to God relationally and really know him. The returning language in this text is highly relational and personal. You can be friends with the God of the universe, Yes, which is yet another reality that makes Christianity unique among other major religions. This is Psalm 25, verse 14, the friendship of the Lord. So that's a thing. The friendship of the Lord is for who? It's for those who fear him. Fear being reverent awe that's backed up by obedience. Or how about Jesus speaking to his disciples in John 15, 14? You are my friends. Okay, that's amazing. You can be friends with Jesus. A lot of songs about that. If you do what I command you. In other words, obedience indicates friendship and it nourishes said friendship. But, you know, isn't, isn't friendship, friendship, it's supposed to be feelings-based. You know, this seems kind of inauthentic. It's like we're trying to force something, you know. Eugene Peterson, one more time, if you will. We live in what one writer has called the age of sensation. We think that if we don't feel something, there can be no authenticity in doing it. But the wisdom of God says something different, that we can act ourselves into a new way of feeling much quicker than we can feel ourselves into a new way of acting. Worship is an act that develops feelings for God, not a feeling for God that is expressed in an act of worship, when we obey the command to praise God and worship, our deep, essential need to be in relationship with God is nurtured. Which I gotta say is such good news for people who are living in the dark. Imagine in those seasons, obediently worshiping only when you feel like it. Only when it feels authentic. You might never worship, honestly. But obedience, worship being an aspect of our obedience to God, actually builds our relationship with God as we give ourselves to Him in faith and trust. And this is always true in every season. Probably a a year or so ago, someone on a very popular Christian podcast told suffering people, specifically people with church hurt, that sometimes they might need to take extended breaks from Scripture to heal. 
Of course, there will be times when it might be very hard to read Scripture. Of course, there will be seasons when it doesn't feel like we have any appetite. And God remains full of grace, even when that describes us. But I need you to know that there is always, always, always refreshment awaiting for us in God's Word. And not just in hearing it but in doing it. Not just in being hearers of the word, but being doers of that word. And this is true even in the most sensitive seasons when professing Christians have heard us, or churches have heard us. I don't think we think about obedience in these kinds of ways. Thus the marginalization of obedience, as if it's bad PR for Christianity, or, thus, the distortion of obedience into this transactional game that will ultimately exhaust us personally or exhaust and harm others when we invite them into that ecosystem. Which, by the way, is where a lot of church hurt comes from. Or, thus, our tendency in the dark. And this is tough, but we need to think about this. Thus, our tendency in the dark to forget that disobedience compromises our feelings of closeness with God. When someone experiencing hard times says, you know, I just don't feel close to God right now, there is often an assumption baked into that statement that the difficult circumstances, the external environment, is a culprit. I think there can be some truth to that. But more often than you might think, it's actually disobedience that's causing the feelings of distance from God. One of the ways that we move toward obedience must therefore entail reimagining what it's for. Church, what areas of disobedience might be persisting in our lives? Maybe something pertaining to generosity to the poor, something pertaining to kindness, toward others, or maybe a lack thereof. Something concerning our sexuality. Something concerning personal or corporate worship. You get the point. Or if we're honest, maybe some of us are languishing in disobedience just across the board. If so, hear me, disobedience, excuse me, obedience is an opportunity for us to navigate the valleys we find ourselves in with wisdom and to nurture ourselves spiritually and to genuinely enjoy friendship with God and find real joy, even in the dark. A lot of times we'll tell hurting people, suffering people, you know, you got to look out for yourself, you got to take care of yourself. I get what that is getting at, but here's what I would also say. Care for yourself through obedience, even when you're in the dark. And much more importantly, please know that our obedience, it, it pleases God so much. It pleases God so much. A theme that actually emerges back in Malachi chapter 2 as God celebrates the righteousness of Levi in contrast to the disobedience of the priests in Malachi's day. But beyond reimagination, there's another major way we move toward obedience, which brings us briefly to our second reflection, God never changes. Chapter 3, verse 6 is a sermon on its own. Totally. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Verse 5, which precedes verse 6. It's brilliant preaching, I know. Very insightful. It foretells a coming day of judgment for Israel on account of issues we discussed earlier, sorcery, adultery, oppressing workers, neglecting the vulnerable, etc. Yet, Israel will not be fully consumed, for the Lord doesn't change. And he made a promise to Israel that he intends to keep. Israel has sinned grievously, uh, grievously again and again and again in different eras and different kinds of ways. And yet, God promised Abraham to bring blessing and 
redemption to them and blessing to the world through them. And he will keep that promise because the Lord never changes. We change. We're all sorts of erratic. But God is perfectly consistent and faithful, and he does not change. And all of this is basically just a fancy way to describe grace, isn't it? Completely undeserved favor here on account of God's character and nature. A God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And notice that this revelation of God's character, this announcement concerning who God is, that is what God uses to move Israel to return to him and to obey him. The headline here isn't Israel do better. That's not really a Christian phrase. The headline is that they get to be in relationship with him if they will return to him and obey him. That It's not too late, even though it really should be too late. And it's not too late because God never changes. He keeps his promises and he's full of grace. And the idea that God has in mind here, that the way this sort of works is that as the Israelites are reminded of who God is, and as they look upon him and consider this God, the God of Jacob, the Holy and Righteous One, they would put their faith in him. They would repent of their sin, their relative lack of holiness, be so amazed by this great God that they would be moved to trust Him instead of trusting in themselves, and then live in a way that backs up that faith, that demonstrates that they have, in fact, put their faith in God. That they would fear the Lord, a, a kind of reverent awe that, that catalyzes worshipful action in keeping with God's law and the terms of the covenant that God made with his people. A day of judgment will come. There's a massive theme in the prophets. We talked about it when we ended our Daniel series, and here it is again. And it comes up in a rather arresting way here in chapter 4 concerning the plight of the wicked and the righteous. Did you catch this? For behold, the day is coming, and... God is very clear about what's coming. Uh, it's a day that's burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the saw, for the wicked couldn't be worse for the righteous wouldn't be better. God is supremely patient, but he's not infinitely patient. Judgment is coming. But until that day comes, those who hear God's word have an opportunity to respond to that word by repenting of their sin and trusting God in faith. On the basis of what? Why can God allow this? Is he just sort of having a whatever view of sin? Is he, is he looking the other way? What is going on here? He allows it on the basis of something rather amazing foretold in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So here's the thing, by Malachi's day, Elijah had already come. If you want to read more about this, start in 1 Kings 17 and keep reading. Be, fur, be sure to catch the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18, if you want to feel just mm, pumped up as a follower of Jesus. So he had already come. So who's this other Elijah? Who are we talking about? It's a good chance this is actually a reference to John the Baptist, 
who was a forerunner, prophetic forerunner to Jesus and Jesus' earthly ministry. Jesus himself makes this connection in the Gospels multiple times. The challenge is John the Baptist actually denies it. Most likely, though, it's kind of like when someone comes to you and says, aren't you the, the greatest baseball player in the history of the world? You're kind of supposed to say no to that. You're like, no. It's a very strong chance that this is, can't know for sure, but there's a very strong chance, but this is what Malachi is pointing to here, the ministry of John the Baptist. Even, though, if you are uncertain about this association, there's clear pointing here toward messianic activity to someone who will bring peace on such a scale. Consider this, that not only will there be a resumption of perfect vertical harmony between God and man, but horizontal harmony in which this person will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. That scale of peace. And then I would add, turn the hearts of God's spiritual children really, really, and truly and permanently toward their heavenly Father. It's a peace that surpasses all possible human imagination. The language here is really striking, but you can tell there's even limitations in this language. You can't even perfectly describe the kinds of peace that's in store for the people of God, the kind of shalom that's coming on account of God's grace. And it's coming on account of what? The blood of Jesus, who ultimately bears the judgment that we deserve who was obedient to the point of death on the cross, that he might bear God's judgment justly aimed at us. That's why, even now, on account of this Messiah coming to bring this kind of peace, that we might enjoy eternal righteousness with God, new heaven, new earth. That's why God ultimately was allowing the Israelites to return to him. And that's why he gives us an opportunity, even this morning, now this afternoon, to put our faith in him, to return to him. And I'll close with this. When we not just know about, but really experience that kind of generosity, then we'll be generous to other people. Thus, the kind of obedience that God talks about in his word. It is catalyzed by ongoing experiences of the generosity of God. It's catalyzed by being blown away by what Jesus did on the cross and the nature of his glorious resurrection from the dead. So actually, if you want to be obedient, the pathway towards obedience is going regularly again and again and again and again to the cross, reminding yourself, reminding one another of the one who came to bring peace on account of his blood. And that's why we say, as Christians in here in the life of the church, that yes, obedience is not transactional, but it does indicate true faith. It does make sense for someone who is really experiencing the generosity of God, who has really turned to him in faith. Amen.